and how to interface with teachers and get a computer science concept across. So I'll leave the stage to <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Uh, this is my very first splash, so I'm excited to be here with all of you. Um, and we've got a nice small group, which is fantastic, because this way I can actually like learn more about who's in the room today. So since we've got like 10 people, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'm hoping maybe at the very least I can get a feel for whether you're a programming language researcher or a professor, or maybe you work for a company. So my name is Emmanuel, and uh, I'm a former computer science major. Uh, after graduation, I worked for a small software company in the Redmond, Washington area. Uh, and after a couple of years in the private sector, I became a secondary school math teacher, working with uh, inner city students in Boston, Massachusetts. So that's sort of my background. And I'm wondering maybe uh, if I can get Steve in the back to just to start us off. Just tell me, who are you and where are you from? Great. Thank you. Awesome. You're not alone. You're not alone. All right. And, Absolutely. That's, a, that's an astute observation. You're, I, I think everyone's experiencing that, too. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm Justin Lewis. I'm a teaching student at uh, Cornell University. Go Big Red. <laughs> that's <laughs> Thank 
Caitlin, bring us home. All right, well, thank you guys for being here. So the folks in the room, we've got programming language researchers, folks who develop domain-specific languages. I mean, we're sort of surrounded by, we're steeped in professors, researchers, and programming language experts. So this is fantastic. And I'm going to start this talk off with a real-world question. So suppose a K-12 teacher, right, primary school, secondary school, just like me, walks into your office, just like now, and asks, I want to bring computer science to my students. What should I teach? And I'm going to be selfish, and I'm actually going to take a moment. I want to learn from you guys. You, you, I'm sure each of you has a favorite language, and you can tell me eloquently why I should teach F Sharp, or why I should teach OCaml or Haskell. So for the folks in the room, who wants to take a stab at answering, what, what should I be teaching my kids? Steve. OK. <laughs> All right. That's, that's a fair question. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What do you think, Caleb? Um, computer science or just programming language? Let's say I, I, uh, I want to teach a programming language. So, so what do you think? Uh, depending on age, I would say Python for the older ages. Mm -hmm. so probably by, I used to yep. say Scratch, but the prompt mm -hmm. just made me say more. Okay. So Python for older kids. Anybody agree with that? Is Python the language for, let's say, high school students? So ages 14 to 18? No. What do you think? So maybe a racket for, for language level reasons, okay? Yeah. Okay, so visual block programming. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, yeah. So what language? Okay, so it could be Java, okay, Python. So it's about the concepts. Good. Maybe one more in the back, yeah. Ah, good question. So uh, K-12 is shorthand for kindergarten through pre-college. So let's say that my class, let's say they're 14 years old. Maybe they need to know about how a binary adder works. Okay. Yep. Okay. Caitlin's going to change her answer. Um, Good. Ah, so maybe what the maybe what the teacher is comfortable with. Okay. Fantastic. So let's bring this back. I some of you have noticed because some of you are starting to smile that I played a little trick on you, um, which is that I asked you an intentionally leading question. I appealed to your domain of expertise, and I got you guys for the most part to focus on language stuff whether it's the visual features of the language, how we address the transition to a textual syntax, whether it's the pedagogical features of a language, if it's Racket, whether it's Python, because you know Python is everywhere. But some of you have, have pushed back against uh, that premise, which is great. So some of you asked about the constraints of the problem. Because computer science education should be looked at as an engineering problem. And the first thing you do is define your constraints. So some of you asked, how old are the kids? Are they five or are they 15? What exposure have they had before? Have these kids been doing closure for the last five years? Right? Or is this their first time ever programming? Is it a required class? Are the students that I'm teaching self-selected, highly motivated kids? Or is everyone thrown into the classroom, even kids who don't want to be there? Does the class meet for 30 minutes every single day or four hours once a month? Is it even a class? Right? Maybe I'm a teacher who's starting an after-school coding club. 
how many kids are there? Am I working with a small group of six kids, or is this a lecture of 100 students? And I think, had I given you more time and let this go on, you would have scoped out all these questions. But coming from a university background, there are other constraints you may not think to ask. For example, is there internet access? If you're all about JavaScript, maybe that's an issue. Has this teacher ever programmed before? Can the students type? That's pretty important. How many students are blind? How many students have sensory motor impairments? Do they have regular computer access at home? That might change the kind of assignments you see fit to assign them. Do they have regular access at school? Believe it or not, that can be a constraint. Any one of these constraints can completely sink a curriculum. It can sink a class. And so if a teacher like me walks up to you guys sometime this year and says, you're the, you're the expert, what should I be teaching? You need to be asking about these constraints, unless you already know the answers. I'm just curious, raise your hand if you know the answers to all of these for the schools in, in the city where you're from. OK, so, so maybe, maybe one of us knows some of these things. But, and that's OK, right? In the United States, I can guarantee you that Greg Morissette doesn't know these answers any better than, than, than we do. The point is, we need to take a humble approach and ask that teacher first about these constraints. If instead we go off and pontificate for two hours about the beauty of Java or of OCaml, all the teacher learns is that college professors like us are not to be trusted. So, like any design problem, not only do we need to identify the constraints, but we should probably like, identify a metric for success. So I'm going to suggest that any successful national CS education program have three ingredients. Maybe more, but at least these three. Number one, it must be equitable. If this thing we design is only good for elite rich kids in schools that have the best computers, that might be nice for them, but I wouldn't call it a success. It needs to be scalable. Maybe you've invented a phenomenal language and a phenomenal curriculum, and because you're a gifted professor and you can teach like crazy, maybe it works for you. But if it can't scale to hundreds of thousands, millions of children taught by tens of thousands of teachers, it's not going to work. And finally, it needs to be rigorous, because let's be honest, YouTube videos are equitable and scalable. It's easy to get 10 million kids to watch a video about coding. I wouldn't say watching a video is rigorous computer science. And I think the Germans in the room were talking about the need for rigor here, which is, sounds like a very German thing to ask about. <laughs> but I, I think that we need all three of these if we're going to be successful with computer science education at the national scale. Getting any one of these is pretty easy, frankly. Getting two is hard. We need all three. So let's talk about the constraints that I face in the United States. In the US, like in many places, we have a series of required courses. So in order for a student to graduate from secondary school, they need to complete some number of units of language, math, art, science, and so on. I'm assuming that's fairly common around the world, yeah? OK. Unsurprisingly, not every student passes all of these classes the first time. So they may have to repeat a class. But what might surprise you is that repeating that class often means they have no room in their schedule for anything else. So here's an example of a hypothetical high school schedule, secondary school schedule. The student starts with a year of algebra. In the United States, algebra is its own course. And then they progress through a sequence. And they take four years of language, history, art, and science. And look, computer science is in the schedule. Every kid is going to learn computer science. But what if that student fails their first year of algebra? Well, they have to retake it in the second year, which means now they're not even going to see calculus. So we've just screwed up this pathway. But most schools will also assign a supplementary remedial math class to give kids a double dose and make sure they can pass that class. So they're also losing out on an art class. And certain sciences have prerequisites for mathematics. If you don't know basic algebra, it's difficult to do physics, for example. right? This problem gets twice as bad if a student fails a second class. Now they have no room in their schedule for anything that isn't a required course. So if we are trying to get computer science into schools in our country, this is a major design constraint for us. Because the kids who fail these classes, by the way, tend to break along race lines and class lines in the United States. So we're losing equity right off the bat. The only kids who can take the class are the kids who are passing all their required courses. So this is a problem. Second constraint. In the United States, education is hyper-local. It's decided at the local level. Individual cities and school districts make determinations, not the state, not the country. 
so what does this mean? There is no such thing as a national standard for computer science in the US. Schools can make it up on their own. There's no such thing as a national computer science teacher certification. Impact of this is threefold. Number one, computer science can be anything you want it to be. You can teach a ki kids a semester-long class on Excel or a semester-long class on Haskell. It's all computer science, right? Let's say you guys want to build a computer science curriculum that teaches JavaScript or Scratch. Well, guess what? You have no control over who's going to teach it. They could be an art teacher who's never touched a computer or a math teacher with an engineering background. So if you don't know who's going to teach your course, that's a design constraint on what you develop. And for you guys, professors, this really screws you over at the university level. Because if an American student like me applies to your university and says, I have four years of computer science, you don't know if that means I'm a master of monads or merely a PowerPoint professional. Yeah? That's a good question. Next slide. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. That these design constraints would suggest that a national CS education system in a country that has these constraints, like ours, might be a little difficult. There, if you're willing to sacrifice equity, if you're willing to sacrifice scale, there's a lot of solutions. But I'm not convinced that, that we should be sacrificing those. So in this climate of hyper-locality, where every school or every city or every university is designing their own pet computer science course, these courses exist in a vacuum. There's walls between these courses, which means every one of them treats itself as an introductory first-year course. So in the US right now, our advanced placement, top level, you know, just before you go on to college, computer science class, makes the exact same assumption about students' prior knowledge as our kindergarten computer science class. They both assume kids have never seen programming before. That's insane. And that causes a lot of problems. So for example, if you build walls between courses, for students, it's very difficult for them to build deep knowledge. Because every new computer science course that student takes is another introductory class. So it's very hard to deepen what they're learning. For schools, they have to build a pathway. So, I, and I'm sure this is not solely a United States thing. You guys may, may know professors or groups in your, in your cities and your countries that are developing multiple computer science curricula. But then if a school wants to implement two different classes, how do they know which comes first if they're both intro level? It requires a depth of content and an enormous amount of administrative overhead for a school to stitch these intro courses into some reasonable pathway. And most schools just don't have it. And it's particularly bad for teachers because computer science teachers have no ability to see the breadth or depth of the field. Two chemistry teachers might teach different parts of chemistry. Maybe this teacher teaches organic chemistry, and that teacher teaches physical chemistry. But they're both grounded in their sense for the breadth of the content. Even if they use different textbooks or different kinds of you know, bun Bunsen burners or something, they can still agree on the field. Computer science teachers, because there's walls between these classes, all they have to go on is the course they teach or the tool they use. So it's perfectly normal to have a computer science teacher say, I teach Scratch, I teach Python, I teach Java. How crazy would it be if a chemistry teacher said, I teach Bunsen burner? Mm -hmm. Or a math teacher said, I teach Hewlett Packard calculator. Right? We force CS teachers to identify by the tool, not the content. It's the only discipline where that's the case. And it's because we have these walls between courses. That's a problem. So the takeaway at this point is simple. In the United States, we have a phrase, let a million flowers bloom, right? We have no central control, so we'll just let everybody experiment with their own thing. And I'm here to tell you that letting a million flowers bloom isn't going to make a dent if our goal is national computer science education. If you, if you at your university have a curriculum that's being developed and another university has another curriculum, make sure they talk. If you don't have synergy between these two, you're going to have more intro curricula developed in a vacuum, and you're going to hit those design constraints. Now, I don't have a silver bullet for how to fix this if you happen to be in a place with local control. But I can tell you a good place to start. So this year in the United States, I was involved in the creation of a unique professional development opportunity called CSPD Week, Computer Science Professional Development Week. CSPD Week was a collaboration between the three largest in-school computer science curricula 
in the country. CS Principal, Exploring Computer Science, and Bootstrap. Most of the time, a, a CS teacher in the United States signs up for one class. I'm going to be an ECS teacher. And they go to an ECS workshop, and they learn ECS. And they're surrounded by ECS teachers, and that's that. At CSPD Week, we brought together 300 teachers from around the country. We brought them to a central location where they worked for five days, and each teacher signed up for one particular track. But we housed them together in a dorm. So teachers were sharing a room with teachers from a different track. They were eating in the cafeteria with teachers from a different track. Which means, think about how you were in college. You were hanging out with people who took different courses, who were learning different subjects. And you start to cross-pollinate. So we had teachers sharing with one another what they had learned. Oh, what did you do in CS principles? Oh, that's so interesting. Here's what I did in ECS. And they left with a stronger sense for community mindset than any professional development workshop we have yet seen. They saw themselves as grounded in the depth and breadth of the field, not as I'm an ECS teacher or I'm a bootstrap teacher. So we're not there yet, but this is a good place to start. But maybe you're in the UK, right? Maybe you're in a country that has central control and you have the ability to build a national CS pathway. So you don't need to worry about walls between courses. You still have to worry about walls between subjects. And you've got three crappy options. You can choose the expensive way, you can choose the wrong way, or you can choose the hard way. Let's talk about the expensive way. So, if we want to build a national CS pathway, we have to do a couple of things. First, we need a national computer science teacher certification requirement. Right? There must be some way for any teacher in your country, whether they're, a, they're teaching 10-year-olds or 17-year-olds, they should know what they have to do to become certified as a computer science teacher. Raise your hand if that exists right now in your country. All right, All right so maybe a little bit. All right, good. So you, and where, where are you from? From Austria. Okay, great. So let's, let's say you've got this one settled. Everyone else in the room, we have a long way to go. <laughs> and it's going to take a lot of years and a lot of dollars to build a certification pathway, right? This is a policy issue. But the gentleman from Austria is all set and ready to rock. Congratulations. <laughs> Step two, recruit and train the tens of thousands of computer science teachers or thousands of computer science teachers that you need to teach the kids, right? Have them get certified. How, how's Austria on this spent? Do you have enough teachers certified? Yes. Excellent. All right. Guys, Austria is kicking your butts. He's doing great. So recruiting and training thousands of computer science teachers also costs money and time. This is non-trivial. And let's assume that every single one of these teachers, now that they know how to, how to do computer science, stays in, in, in the classroom. They don't change their mind and decide to go work for Google. If they do that, well, we still have to pay their salary, right? We still have to pay them something, which is going to take millions or billions every single year to pay these thousands of new teacher salaries. And if the government passes this budget for like two years, the teachers aren't going to go for it because they know in two years the funding dries up, they're out of the job. So we need a long-term commitment from the government to make this happen. How's Austria doing there? Okay. They have the certification. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Great. Gotcha. Okay, so the, but there is, the schools have the money to hire them. So every school can afford a computer science teacher. Fantastic. Wow. So, so for everybody else... To, yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we haven't even gotten to... <laughs> you're, yes, you're right. But look, even if we solve all these problems, there's still a finite number of hours in the school day and rooms in the school building. So unless you're like Austria, where is this going to fit? We need to solve all four of these, and that's going to take a lot of time. This is the expensive way. But you know what? I have a better idea. What if all of us make a pact right now that we're all going to go back to our home countries, and we're going to contact the local school, and we're going to say, you know what? I'm a computer science professor. I want to help out. So I'm going to get some undergrads together. I'll offer them a credit or something. And I'll let them volunteer to teach an after-school coding club. Wouldn't that be great? We could do like after-school Haskell or do like a little, a little you know, OCaml class or something. That would be great. Why not, right? Well, this brings us to the wrong way. 
because the moment you want to do some sort of volunteer after school, you know, teach F sharp at the local club kind of thing, you got to be willing to give up a couple of things. One of the things already we've mentioned is you have to give up equity. Because the only kids who are going to show up for your after school club are the kids who deliberately chose to spend that time learning computer science as opposed to after school football, after school violin, after school having a job because they need money, after school taking care of their little brother or sister because maybe mom has a job and, and can't be home to take care of them. So the only kids who will show up are the kids with means and opportunity. So we give up on equity. But also, recruiting those five undergrads and making sure that there's enough of them to, to constantly staff the club, that's hard. Right? Those five undergrads, you had to really pull their teeth to get them to do it. And maybe if you're lucky over the course of a year, they're going to reach 50 children. But those undergrads, once they move on to the next class, their course schedule changes. You've got to find more undergrads. A full-time teacher reaches over 100 kids every year and keeps coming back. So you're going to spend more and more of your time recruiting undergrads, recruiting grad students to volunteer at these schools, which means you're giving up on scale, too. This is not a scalable solution. And finally, if you're teaching at an after-school coding club, kids are you know, dropping in and dropping out, right? Maybe one kid shows up every day, another kid decides, I'm going to do this for a little while, but now I don't like it. I'll, I'll go play football while the weather's nice. Then I come back and I'll, I'll do some more coding. This is not an environment that's conducive to building rigorous, structured computer science. So you have to be OK giving that up, too. Let me be clear. This is still CS education. This is not a bad thing. If you currently volunteer at your local school and you're running a little F-sharp club, that's awesome. And, and you deserve credit for that. But let's not confuse this approach to CS education with the kind of solution we need to build if our goal is scalable, rigorous, and equitable CS education for the country. Right? These are different goals. Let's not confuse the two. So I can tell you that this is important because I tried it. Bootstrap partnered with the largest after-school program in the United States to deliver after-school computing. And this program was awesome. They had the kids already signed up. We didn't have to recruit them. They had the insurance and liability, the legal things taken care of. By the way, if you haven't thought about that, your, your undergrads are going to have to deal with that. They even had snack, right? So they brought in pretzels and cookies to make sure the kids had food every day, so we didn't have to worry about that. This seems like an optimal situation. And we started in Boston. After three years, we were the largest provider of after-school computer science in the city. And we shut it down because we saw the impact we were having, and it wasn't even in the same universe as what we needed. So this is years of hard-fought battle scars that I am giving to you. You can do this if you want, but if your goal is scale, equity, and rigor, I wouldn't spend the time. So what's the other option? What else could we do? Should we give up? Just give up on computer science in schools? No. Well, some folks have this idea. They said, well, what if, what if we integrate computer science into one of those required classes? What if there was a way to, to squeeze computer science into those subjects? And let's use algebra as an example. And I think it's a good one. Algebra is the gateway to virtually all STEM fields, right? If you fail algebra, if you don't understand functions, yeah, you're not going to become a mathematician. But you're also not going to model projectile motion in physics. You're not going to balance chemical equations. You're not going to model population growth or rates of change in biology. If you want to go into finance, accounting, you want to be an economist, all of these require algebra. So it's a critical skill. And a student who drops out, who gives up at algebra, has made a career decision that basically says, I don't want those high-paying careers. So there's an equity issue here, too. And it's a required class. Every student has to take it. So if we close our eyes, we can imagine, what if every algebra class actually taught computer science? Certification, solved. We already have math certification. Training teachers, we already have a training pipeline. We already have teachers in every school that can reach every child. And it's a required class, right? So we, we solve all these constraints. It's basically a free lunch. But what's that saying about a free lunch? I don't know if, it, if that translates into, into other countries. Do you guys have a saying like this? There's, n there's no such thing as a free lunch. So here's the thing. We can solve all these constraints in one fell swoop, but then we have to trade them for another set of constraints. 
this is why it's called the hard way. and i'll give you an example once you start thinking about integrating computer science into math suddenly you have to pick your language and your tool not based on how much you love it but how well it jives with the with the course you're embedding it into so let's take numbers math has numbers right so let's say you're my students and i'm teaching a computer science integrated math class what's one divided by two raise your hand if you know this kids I'm, let's pretend you're 13 years old what's one divided by two who knows it i see some smiles one, one divided by two we got a couple what do you think 0.5, anyone disagree? One half. one half? One half? Maybe it's irrational? Great. Um, bad news, guys, this is a Java integrated math class, so you're all wrong. <laughs> but this is a real problem if you're a math teacher and you're working with students, right? Like, you, can't, you cannot have those kinds of semantics for numbers. And we all know how variables work. It's, it's quite simple. You assign 10 into x, and then you can increment it and store the new value back into x, right? This is how Scratch treats variables. This is Python variables. And then if we subtract x from both sides, we've proven that 0 equals 2. Hooray! No. Not appropriate for a math class. And of course, we know that functions, functions don't really have to pass the vertical line test, right? They can have any properties they want. Huge problem. The point here is, if you want kids to know about numbers, functions, and variables, Scratch might be a bad idea, since it lacks numbers and functions and variables. Not to say Scratch is bad, but once you start thinking about integration, you have to choose your language very carefully. Semantics matter. So, we pick a language. Let's say we pick a language that's great for math. We're not done. You have to write a curriculum. So if you, as a professor, want to help out, pick a good language and write a curriculum. And by curriculum, I don't just mean a list of fun activities. Kids will do this, then this, then this, it'll be fun. No, 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 no. A teacher expects a curriculum to include lesson plans, homework assignments, assessments, rubrics, a connection to the standards that they have to teach, right? This is a rigorous approach that we need. Otherwise, teachers are going to say, great, you gave me a nifty tool. What do I do with it? I think in the PL community in particular, we have a tendency to build awesome tools, hand them to teachers, and say, you figure out the rest. You're the teacher. That's not what teachers are for, right? We need to think through the curricular implications, and we need to think through the pedagogical implications, because there's more to being a great teacher than having a great book. So what does it look like to teach your language of choice? How do you differentiate instruction? How do you deal with error messages? How do you map the concepts for students who are high ability and low ability? You have to develop all three of these. And by the way, your curriculum and your pedagogy is going to need to look like a math class. If it looks like a computer science curriculum, no math teacher is going to take it. They're going to say, I'm here to t I have to teach math. I can't squeeze this in. It cannot appear to be something extra. And if that's not enough, these have to be developed in concert with one another because there's a dependency graph here. Suppose your pedagogy relies on students testing hypotheses. Well, then maybe you need a language that has low friction unit tests. If you're working with 10-year-olds, Java might be a tough choice because JUnit is cumbersome. And there's no such thing as Scratch Unit. So if you're choosing Scratch or Snap, that's a wonderful tool. But that means you can't have that kind of pedagogy. And these dependencies work across all three. So it's a very tightly connected graph that we have to consider. Any questions? So this is hard. You guys want to see an example of how to do it right? Okay. So, Bootstrap is the project I'm privileged to work on. Uh, we take computer science and infuse it into algebra. That's one of our curricular modules. We have others. And here's how we did it. So, at the language level, what do you think you need if you're building a language for math teachers? What, what, what's a requirement you might have? Yeah? It should be functional, right? I'm not, I mean, no disrespect to, to, C sharp, to C++, but it should be functional if that's our goal. Excellent. Anything else that we might want to have in this language? Liveness. Yeah. Yeah, a REPL, because that impacts your pedagogy. Excellent thinking. Excellent. Any other factors in our language? So I'll add two more. 
coming as myself being a math teacher, um, unit testing is critical in a math class. Most math teachers, when they're going through a word problem with their students, they'll have students come up with concrete examples and then generalize to a formal abstract solution. You need to be able to have those examples be automatically checked. So you want unit testing to be easy. Personally, we think that images are really engaging for kids. We wanted students to be able to co generate, compose, and transform images. So we thought that they should be first class in our choice of language. You may have other, other considerations. Then we built a curriculum. This curriculum has all the fixins, lesson plans, homework assignments, standards alignment to math standards. So when a, a math teacher, a secondary math teacher, can look at our curriculum and see exactly how it fits and where it fits into the work they already have to cover. And then we developed a narrative project, a project that ties the whole class together. So in the Bootstrap Algebra module, every child builds a video game of their own design using purely algebraic concepts. And then we developed a pedagogy. And what does it mean to have pedagogy? Well, in math, it means structured problem solving. And look, let's be honest, in the computer science world, even at the college level, we often trick ourselves into thinking that we teach our kids problem solving just because we give them problems to solve. Right? And that's not how it works. And math teachers know that better than anyone. So we have a structured approach to problem solving that mirrors what math teachers already do. They work through functions in multiple representations. They go from worked examples to abstract solutions. And there's some other items in here as well. And fortunately, we were able to borrow a lot of the pedagogy and the language from how to design programs. Is anyone here familiar with how to design programs? So this is the curriculum from the Racket folks. They did an unbelievable job. So we're standing on their shoulders. And what we've done is we've essentially adapted the first few chapters from that book into a primary and secondary school level curriculum that's targeted towards working math teachers. So we're thankful to stand on their shoulders. And then we developed them in concert with one another. And I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions at the end of this, because you may want to see what some of this looks like. The, the language error messages we have customized to work well with our pedagogy. The curriculum itself has important connections to the language and to the pedagogy. I mean, this goes so deep. Um, and there's a lot of little examples I can show you. But it's essential if you want to get math teachers teaching computer science. This is the team that I'm privileged to work with. We're a small team. There's four of us serving the entire country. And we're able to get away with this because we've built something that flies in math classrooms. And there's thousands of math teachers already there. So we have the ability to scale and to scale radically. So what I'd like to do is give you guys a demo of a real lesson from Bootstrap. Would you guys like to see that? OK. So let's pretend that you guys are my students. You're all. 13 years old, 14 years old, and you're in a, a math class, and I happen to be teaching algebra. Here's a word problem. Rocket blasts off, traveling at 7 meters per second. Write a function that takes in the number of seconds passed and produces the height of the rocket. If you can think back to your days as a young student, does this look familiar? Does this look like the kind of problem you've seen in school? It's a standard math problem. So what would a, a regular math teacher do? Well, Typically, they'll start by having the class restate the problem, right? Repeat the problem back in your own words. It's a good way of checking for understanding. Then they might have the students come up with examples. So how far did the rocket go after one second? Two seconds? Three seconds? And then they would generalize from those examples to a formal solution, right? They'd say, what's the pattern? What's the rule? How are we generating these heights? So this is how it looks in a standard math class pencil and paper, no computers at all. Let's talk about how we do this in Bootstrap. So let's set up the classroom. Number one, in Bootstrap, all students are working in pairs. So if you're not sitting next to somebody, find somebody, introduce yourself, say hello. I want you guys to be seated next to someone you'll be working with for this class. Take a minute, find a partner. Matthias, am I speaking too fast? No. Okay. For me, years, about 10 years of work. All right, secondly, does everyone have a buddy? 
if you look under your chairs, we've got these handouts. This is a single sheet of paper, and we've also given you a, a little notebook, something with a hard cardboard back so you can write on it. So find that paper for yourself, hold it up, make sure you've got it. Yeah. You know, we have enough for you to have one per person if you like. Yeah. All right, so, all right, children, everyone have your paper? You're good? All right. So, class, what I'd like to do is start this out by having a volunteer student read the word problem at the top of the page in a loud, clear voice. So who's got a nice, loud voice? Excellent, yeah. A rocket blasts off, traveling at seven meters per second, right? Function called rocket dash height that takes in the number of seconds that have passed since the rocket took off and which produces the height of the rocket at that time. Fantastic. Well done. Now, at this point in the curriculum, students in Bootstrap have already been introduced to something called a contract. A contract is basically a type specification. Name of the function, the input types, and the output type. So what I'd like you to do with your partner, and I'm not going to give you any further instruction for this, is take a minute and just fill in this top line, the name, domain, and range of this function using the information in the word problem. Take a minute, go. Just that top line. The domain is the, the type of inputs. What, ki what kind of inputs are going into this function? Feels good. Okay. Looking good. For the, this, for this sub-language, yes. But yeah, obviously it doesn't always have the name, for example. Functions don't need names. It always has a domain and a range, but it doesn't always have a name. Like it could be uh, a lambda, just an anonymous function. Yes, yeah. In, in this class, we just tell kids they all have three. All right, take another 10 seconds, just the contract. Five, four, three, two, and we're back. All right, boys and girls, what was the name of the function? What did you write for the name of the function? Who's got it? Yes, Caitlin. Rocket dash height. Rocket dash height, fantastic. And Caitlin, how did you know that? Where did you get that from? Yeah, it's, it's, it's literally in the word problem. And if I challenged you, you could point at it with your finger. You, you could say, listen, teacher, it's right here. It's right there in black and white. So you're confident. Good. What about the domain of the function? I saw some very different domains, which is great. So who'd like to share what they put for their domain? Yes, in the back. You put time. OK. Any others? Yeah. Number. Number. Interesting. OK. Integer. Integer. Seconds, interesting. Okay. You also put seconds, okay. So, oh, one more. As, as the domain. Seconds, can you, where did you get that it takes the seconds and speed as inputs? Where did you get that in the word problem? Well, well, let's take a look at the word problem. Does the word problem specify what this function consumes? Does it say anywhere? What it's, what it's taking in, perhaps. Yeah. No, and, 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 and this is good, right? The, the point is that, that rather than me saying no, I can say, let's check back. Right? So as a teacher, I don't have to be the oracle that says right or wrong. I can say, let's look back and defend the answer. So is it seconds? Is it numbers? Is it integers? What is it? So depending on what level you're teaching, you may have different levels of specificity that you require of your students. If I'm teaching young children, you know what? It takes in a number and it produces a number. Good enough for me. But if I'm teaching older students, mm -mm -mm. maybe I want them to say it specifies integers or natural numbers, or positive numbers. Maybe I want to use set notation. 
maybe I want to specify perhaps the data type, right? I mean, in, in our type system, right, the types denote sets of values. That's what the domain and range are. Same in math as in programming. Okay, now, oh, any questions on that before I go on? Okay, now, math teachers, and I suspect some of you in your programming classes ask your students to do this too. You'll say, before you try to give me a solution, restate the problem so I know that you understand it. So take a minute with your partner, and I want you to come up with a really good purpose statement that describes completely, correctly, and concisely the behavior of this function. It's harder than it sounds. So take a minute, talk with your buddy sitting next to you, and write down a good purpose statement for this function. Think. Yeah, we well, pretty much repeat the, the word problem. Ah, well, it's interesting. So a lot of kids will rewrite the word problem, but yeah. they'll change the word blasts to takes. They'll say it takes off, and then they'll rewrite the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not a good restatement, right? So how do you how do you crystallize the meaning of the word problem? That's, that's a great way to do it, yeah. And, and look, I mean, essentially trivial transformations aren't interesting, right? Like, you know, we're, so we want students to be doing, like you're just describing, a non-trivial transformation that still preserves the semantics of the problem. So you're saying this is a non-trivial transformation. Well, for you, for you, this might, what, what you just said, where you start with produces, that might feel trivial for you. But for an 11-year-old, not trivial at all. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm seeing some really interesting, really good purpose statements. Let me pull back the curtain for a second. So we use a heuristic in Bootstrap, um, which is we, we tell students that if you can't figure out what to write, make a checklist. The purpose statement should say what the function consumes, what it produces, and whatever necessary information you think you need for how it produces that. So, Typically, we're going to get 10 different purpose statements in a room full of 10 people. So I want to hear three volunteers to share what they wrote down for their purpose statement. So what do you guys think? What did you write? Uh, I wrote that it uh, multiplies the speed 7 by the time to the input to produce the height. Multiplies by the, the speed 7 by the time, the input, to produce the height. Fantastic. Any others? Anyone do anything different? Yeah. Computes the height in meters, very nice, uh, after the given number of seconds when it's traveling at seven meters per second. Fantastic. Do you want to share what you were discussing? Fabulous. These are all great answers, but there are some answers that are not great, and I'll give you an example. Given the number of seconds, produce the height of the rocket. That's perfectly perfectly terrible purpose statement because it's missing some important bits of information. Now, I know all of you are, are not actually 13-year-old children. You're all actually a very smart adults. So this exercise might have seemed quite trivial to you. But I want to point out, restating a problem correctly is essentially a non-trivial, we're, we're asking students to do a non-trivial transformation from the word problem into something else that preserves the structure and the semantics of the original problem. And for an 11-year-old, this is very difficult to do. Right? They can do trivial transformations. They'll write, a rocket takes off traveling at 7 meters per second. And then they'll just copy the whole word problem. But that's not a meaningful transformation. So we want something meaningful. So how do you assess? How do you assess whether or not a student has restated the problem correctly? Professors in the room, do any of you, when you give your students a problem set, do you ever ask your students, maybe if they come to you for help, to have them say what they think they're supposed to be doing? Raise your hand if, you, if this is a, a, a practice you guys use. Yeah, but half the folks in the room already do this. So how do you assess if a student restated the problem correctly or not? Matthias. Uh, 
ah, so so it must be correct, it must be clear, and it must be concise. Nothing else except what's true. So, for example, not leaving out the facts of the yep. or not adding anything that is like, not consistent. Excellent. What about for the rest of you who, who teach this stuff? Do you have a way for a student to assess for themselves if they restated the problem correctly? Or do they have to come to you as the oracle? Mm -hmm. It's the same technique. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's, it's state your thinking, state your intention, mm -hmm. because sometimes their code works perfectly, but their intention ain't what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important, whenever possible, to let students check for themselves if they've restated the problem correctly. Did everyone write down a purpose statement on your paper? So here's how we assess it. See that word problem? Oh, sorry, here's, here's a purpose statement. Given the number of seconds, what's the height traveling at seven? So that word problem, it's gone. Fold over the top of your paper so you can no longer see the word problem. It's gone. So all you can see now is your contract and your purpose statement, the previous phase of the compiler. Let's write some unit tests because we all know that we should be unit, writing unit tests before we start coding, right? Right? That's a good idea, hopefully, we tell our kids to do. So at this point in the curriculum, students know the, the syntax of unit tests, and they know that they have to write open parentheses, the word example, and then they need the function name. Class, what is my function name? Raise your hand if you can tell me the name of the function that I'm working on here. Got a couple of folks. Uh, who have I not called in a while? Yes. Yes, Robert. Yeah, rocket dash height. And Robert, that's a fantastic answer. Where did you get that from? Uh, from the contract. From the contract, right? We just pull it down. We didn't need to go back to the word problem because we can use our own work. And now we have to give rocket height two numbers, right? Two inputs, right? We only give it one. How, how do we know we only give it one? Where does it say that? The domain only says, oh, good, I can use my previous work to check myself. I, uh, it only takes in one number. OK, so rocket height of 15. So after 15 seconds, where should the rocket be? What, what should this function produce? Raise your hand if you've got a, a suggestion for what I should write over here. We've got some familiar hands. I love seeing them. You can keep them up. But who else? Who's got, who else thinks they have an idea? for what this student should write as a solution. <coughs> Rocket height of 15 yields 105. So maybe we write 105. That's great. But, but let's say I'm not good at doing math in my head. In fact, d did your math teacher ever tell you to show your work when you were a kid? Yes. I mean, maybe they didn't. So, so look, a, a teacher can say, you know what, 105, that's fine. That's totally fine. Kudos. But maybe a different teacher is going to say, I want you to show your work. So what else could I write here? 7 times 15, right? So both are correct. You're, you're perfectly correct, and so are you. Now, wait a second. Where did I get the 15 from? That was my input. Where did I get the 7 from? from the purpose statement. And this is the moment where a student who left out that seven realizes I'm missing something. If you can't write a unit test based on your contract and purpose, then you should unfold the paper, go back, and correct it. At each step, we're transforming the word problem into increasingly formal semantics. And we, we can only go in one direction. We can't go back. All right, so now let's say I'm, I'm your little brother. And I'm stuck. Help, I don't know what goes here. Help, what goes here? What would you tell me if I was your, if I was your little brother? What could, you, what could you point me towards to help me out? Caitlin. Can you ask the question name earlier? Yeah. Do, do, do you have it in your contract? Oh, yes, I do. You're right. I forgot about that. And then, wait, 
do I have to give it one number or two? Or should it be an image? Should it be a picture of a rocket? I'm stuck. I don't know what, what goes here. Where could you, what kind of hint could you give me? What did I do before? Well, how did I know I only needed 15 here? What tells me that I only need one number in my input? The domain. So you could tell your little brother, look at your domain. If it says one number, that's all you got to put. Same thing here. If you're stuck, look at your purpose statement, and it should tell you enough to complete this. So, yeah. That's a great question. So he's, he's asking, why did I decide to go with prefix? And I've got a very good answer. Will you, will you promise to ask that after we're done? No? OK, so does everyone have two examples written down? Good to go? Hopefully, this is, because this is actually going to matter. All right, I look at these two examples, and I realize they're awfully similar, aren't they? Right? Most of the examples are just duplicated. Right? I have sevens in both places. So I want you and your partner to circle all of the stuff that is different. Circle the things that are changeable from example to example. And again, for adults, this is like super trivial. But for younger kids and for more complex problems, this, this can be difficult. So what'd you circle? Yes. Beautiful. Right? This is pretty easy for us to see. Now we need to label it. What do the 15 and the 289 represent? Is it the number of meters? The number of astronauts? Is it the weight of the rocket? What does that number represent? Seconds. Fantastic. Where did you get that? How did you know it was seconds? It's in the purpose statement. Right? The label should come from the purpose statement. And if, it, if you can't find it, maybe that means we need to go back to the word problem and figure it out. Caitlin. So the question is, should the domain say seconds or number? So, so for different ages, you may want to go in different directions. What we do for introductory algebra is we, we specify that the domain and range must specify data type. And then you can name that data type to talk about what it represents in the purpose statement. But there are teachers who do it differently, and that's OK. Yeah? Actually, uh, The units are right here. But right, but they are in the purpose statement, and they have to do both. Now, just to to repeat what I said, as a teacher, you may decide differently, and that's perfectly okay. But the the heuristic that we use is you have to say both the contract and the purpose. One specifies the data type, the other specifies the units. But you have flexibility in how you do this. So we've got our examples. We've circled and labeled them. Guess what? Get rid of the contract and purpose. Fold it over. We don't need it anymore. We don't need it. Right? The goal is that students are systematically constructing this function by thinking through multiple representations. So we've got our examples. And in a, in a, in a university level computer science class, Often you have students who will tell you, writing type signatures in unit tests is so boring. It's such a drag. Do you get that at all in your, from your students? I don't want to write unit tests. Just let me write the code. Let me write the real code, right? Yeah, that's real programming. The thing is, yeah, go ahead. So say, say more about why. 
so you're absolutely right that for different classes of functions this this will not scale in fact as the problems get more complex this will cause problems are you familiar with how to design programs so this is a dramatically down sampled version of an industrial strength pedagogy that is used at a number of universities around the world to teach programming it's a seven step recipe that goes far more in depth and scales up to far more complex problems but we're essentially building a domain specific pedagogy for a very narrow class of algebra problems and as the problems grow this starts to break and we extend it so i think your point is well taken if it were an arbitrary function and all i knew were two points that's a problem because there's an infinite number of polynomials that can go through two points but if we're given in the word problem that it's a linear function and at this stage the teacher may not have even talked about other functions the fact that the word problem is gone doesn't mean we can't go back right at every stage if i were to ask you where did you get that where did you get rocket height from well i got it from the contract well where did you get that contract from from the word problem right so at every step i could challenge that student and they could work back to first principles and say here's where i got it from the problem so the specification isn't destroyed but we're asking students to gradually formalize more and more does that make sense All right. Any any other questions? No, I mean, this, we've we've got the time, and this is an, this is a this is a subtle point to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. So just to point out what I had said earlier, in, in this particular language, by the way, semicolon is the commenting symbol, which means that these there's enormous flexibility on the part of the instructor for where they want to expend their energy and their constraints for the students. So for young students, a teacher might say, you know what, number's good enough. If it's you, you may you may not find it to be good enough. You may find it to be completely wrong. You want to have them specify seconds, and that's that's essentially a control that you have as a teacher. For where you expend that energy, so this is open. This is open and flexible. Caitlin, you want to add to that? Just building on what you're saying, then, yeah. do you think the, the goal of it being open and flexible like that is so mm -hmm. teachers can come into it with different knowledge of how their students learn or different knowledge of where they're at? So rather yeah. than kind of starting from the most precise thing, they want to build up that knowledge. So as they go, and then it's like you don't teach like at them. Right. Right. You you need it to have multiple points of entry for teachers who may be very low on the spectrum. Right. They they don't have a lot of content knowledge. They're just starting. But it must be flexible to scale up to a teacher who demands a, a much higher degree of rigor from his students. Um, and so there there are these these options. So. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. Yeah. Well, and this is an, and this is significant because we want students to confront the type of data that is used to represent their meaning making. So if they if the meaning they've made here is seconds, we want to challenge them and say, hold on, we'll get to that. How will you represent seconds in your program? Will it be numbers? Will it be? Or a different teacher might say, "Will it be naturals, positive naturals? How do you represent this?" So we want that. We want them to tackle that at the very beginning, and then write down their meaning as their purpose statement. I saw another. Yeah. That is absolutely a risk. 
And whenever you write a curriculum, there's a risk that people who use it may struggle, right? Which is why professional development is important and which is why you need to be aware of the constraints. So if I know I'm gonna be working with math teachers, I have a reasonable assumption about the content knowledge they'll come in with. If I were teaching this to history teachers, I might have constructed a very different vehicle for them. So, yeah. I would say, for the, for the context of this class, seconds is a variable name that gets you know, dynamically uh, bound to the number that is passed in at runtime. And for a math teacher, none of what I said is even relevant. For a math teacher, it's the name of the variable. Seconds is just the name. We could have called it X. We could have called it broccoli. But it's important to choose a name that makes sense. So it's, it's, it's strictly a meaning-making exercise for kids to make sure that when they abstract from an example to a, a, a function definition, that they're aware of what these numbers actually mean. I think somebody had mentioned writing down units. Right? So in this situation, we want students to recognize that this number represents the number of seconds. And that's, that's all she Mm-hmm. Then, and th then in that case, I would say, what did you write for your purpose statement? Did you say flight time? I, I didn't. Okay. And, and, that's, and, and this, is, this is a beautiful case in point, because if a student starts to get uncomfortable and says, I can think of a better name, we could say, well, then let's go back to our purpose. Maybe we didn't restate the problem as, as clearly as we should have. So as long as you put that in your purpose statement, I think that sounds like a great variable name. So I have flight time is one variable. Mm -hmm. I think, I think you're going much deeper into implementation than into pedagogy here. And this recipe is purely a pedagogical tool, right? The students, these students are not concerned with whether it's an application data type and how it's, how it's bound or when it's bound. This is strictly, we are naming this quantity using the best name we can come up with. So you have a, a great name. And we're gonna, we're gonna say that that represents the number of seconds. So, I want to move on because there's some other stuff I want to show you. I'm happy to re rejoin this during the, the Q&A. When students do this work and they reach this point, writing the actual code becomes trivial because all of the things that haven't changed, we just copy. Has the function name changed? No, we're just going to grab it. Other things are fixed. The fact that we're multiplying by seven all the time. But what do I write for the things that are changeable? I can't write 289. So what would I write? What you choose to variable. Yeah, right? Because the thing that is changeable is quite literally the variable. Right? So for younger students, this is a simple construction. And in this course, typically, you know, we tell the story about, oh, I have this older brother, and he's really mean, and he makes fun of me all the time. And he tells me that unit tests are for babies and that writing type specifications is dumb. So he wrote a program, which I'm gonna show you, that simulates a rocket blasting off. And he, he wanted me to let you know that he never does this stuff. He, he, he takes shortcuts. So let's take a look at this program. So here's his program. The first line of code, he's requiring an outside library. He wanted, he wanted me to let you know that that's sort of bringing in some images that he's gonna use. And then he's written the rocket height function the same way you guys did. His contract looks okay, but maybe there's some issues. Let's click run and see what happens. So I click run, and this might be too small for you guys to see. I'll zoom in a little bit if I can. And by the way, this is just a you know, cloud-based environment. So, zoom out. So every time I hit the space bar, we can see time going by, but she's not blasting off. Something is wrong. There's a bug in this code. So let's look at what my brother did. Notice his purpose statement didn't mention the seven at all. He only wrote one example, which didn't show his work and didn't use the seven. Was his example correct, by the way? After zero seconds, is it zero? Zero height, right? So a broken clock is right twice a day. 
one bad unit, you know, one broken unit test can still be correct. But then look, his function body is totally wrong. And so we use this, we tell students, take a couple of minutes with your partner, fix my, my brother's code, you know, point out all the things my brother did wrong. So maybe this should be times seven zero. And maybe this should be, let's say we'll do 10 seconds. And then down here I'll say times seven seconds. When we click run, now she blasts off. And again, for this audience, obviously this is not that exciting. But for primary school and young secondary school kids, this is actually pretty cool. And we've built in this emotional component where the student gets to feel like, wow, I got something right that his jerk of an older brother got wrong. I'm smarter. Because look, students, even at the university level, do not like to critique their own work, but they love to critique other people's work. Right? So by, by flipping it that way, it gives you an in. And, and, humans, and humans like that, right, all humans. And of course, there's a lot more one can do, right? So I can, instead of having a simulation, I can draw a graph of the rocket at different points in time. And some math teachers struggle to get kids to think about different categories of functions, right? Does a quadratic function grow faster than a linear function, right? Or, or can it? And there are some young students who are convinced if I make the slope big enough, a linear function will always be, always be you know, faster. It always grows faster. So how do you communicate the different behavior of these categories of functions? Well, one way to motivate that, and I'm definitely going to have to zoom out a little bit. For those of you who are not familiar with the webcomic XKCD, we have permission from the author here. This is a logarithmic scale map of the universe. Every pixel represents 10 times as much distance as the pixel beneath it. That's why the Eiffel Tower looks sort of stretched out. And the students can blast off and travel through space. But they notice very quickly that she appears to slow down because the amount of space she's traveling is increasing exponentially. So the kids say, well, I want her to get to outer space. This is taking forever. So what's the first thing those students are going to try to change in the code? They'll change the slope. But very quickly, they run into the exact same problem. And so this gives you an in for students to start thinking, well, how do we make it grow faster if slope isn't enough? Well, maybe what I should be doing, let's say I'm doing an exponential. I'm sorry, a, a quadratic. Right? So we're just going to say height equals time squared. Well, that's definitely getting better. That's looking good. And if I wanted, I could see the change on the graph. All right, that's fine. And we can carve out, carve something out. And you'll also notice that this unit testing happens in real time. So I, one of my examples is flat out wrong. And the program instantly tells me so. Right? Because students should realize that each step must be consistent with the following step and the previous step. And there's lots and lots of ways to differentiate this. And I'm not going to go through them all. I just want to give you a little taste. So as a teacher, you can give kids challenges, because in any classroom, some kids finish faster than others. So if you finish quickly, make it fly faster or slower. Make it accelerate. Make it go to a specific height before landing. Make it go to a specific height and land at a specific time. Each of these are trivially simple, rich tasks to understand. They're easy constraints. But for students who may not be familiar, for example, with quadratics, this requires some deep thinking. Now you might be wondering, good lord, Emmanuel, this is such a trivial concept, linear function. Does it really take all this work just to teach one concept? And I'm here to tell you that the answer is yes. It really is. And it, it's, it's yes for multiple reasons. First, this is what it takes to make sure you have a rigorous computer science curriculum, as opposed to kids playing with commands or playing with blocks and interesting stuff happens. This is what it takes to have computer science integrated into a mainstream math class taught by math teachers who have never programmed before. If this stuff isn't there for them, then you are making an assumption about the amount of time and energy those teachers have to implement your curriculum. And that is not a good assumption to make, because teachers are busy. So it does take a lot of work. Please feel free to use ours. We've built a lot of this for the following concepts, and quite a few more. And they're on our website if you want to take a look at them. Caitlin. And are they, how much do they cost to use? It's all free. Really? So in Bootstrap, 
we actually can do something else that's kind of nice. yes, there's a million video game curricula where people build games, and that's great. and yes, we get to have a launch party where kids show off their little graphics, and that's cool. but that little thing we were doing by folding the paper back and forcing you guys to justify by pointing, here's where I got this, here's where I got that, that's a primer for doing code reviews. our 11 and 12 year olds stand up in front of the class and have to defend their code and their decisions behind it in front of a live audience. and we've scaffolded that discussion through the use of this design recipe. so at any point a student can challenge and say that variable name makes no sense to me. A student can say well I got that from my purpose statement because my reading of the word problem was such and such. so when you have it working in, math, in a math class, and by the way when I say working I don't mean kids learn to code, although they do. I mean we're teaching transferable skills. when you take away the computer and you give kids pencil and paper algebra tasks, word problems, function composition, matching representations, it turns out that math students who go through bootstrap outperform a control group who just took the regular math class. so if you're a school principal and you couldn't care less about computer science, you should use us because we're a good math program. and if you happen to care about computer science, great, here's a way to get every student to learn some computer science without having to find room in the budget for a teacher or room in the schedule for a new class. and when you do it this way, you can scale. the team of three people plus me that I showed you earlier, currently we work in, we, we serve more than 15,000 students annually and that's growing very, very quickly. and because every child takes math, 43% of our students are girls and young women. 46% of our students are African American or Latino. and in the United States we've got some very weird, particularly crazy history when it comes to race stuff. But what I can tell you is this. when you look at the students that enroll in optional computer science education programs, the numbers are disastrous. folks brag about having 16% girls. yay, 16%. that's not enough. and the way you get all students is by integrating into a class that all students take. that's what it means. and it's not just algebra. Right? we're also building curricular modules to integrate with physics, lightweight data science and statistics because our goal is to give schools a multi-input pathway to create an integrated computer science curriculum that weaves through multiple courses if they choose. multiple points of interest. so that's it. constraints matter. if you want to set out to build a scalable, rigorous and equitable computer science education program and the first thing you ask is should we teach recursion? stop. that's not even close to the constraints we should be caring about. you want to teach another after school class? phenomenal. do it. go with my blessing. but let's not confuse that with something that's going to scale to serve an entire nation. we've got to build bridges between CS classes. if your university is building a computer science class for the local school, that's great. and maybe there's another university doing the same thing. I'm not saying you should abandon your efforts. I'm saying make sure you talk so that you're not working in a vacuum with walls between classes. and build bridges between subjects. people talk a lot about how learning computer science teaches you how to think. oh, it's good for everything. learn computer science. it'll make you a better writer. it'll make you a better chemist. it'll make you a better mathematician. okay, if that's true, then why teach computer science at all if kids are learning how to write, how to do physics and how to do chemistry? that'll just transfer back into our field as well. we have to practice what we preach. if you really think these are transferable skills, you have to aim in as part of your design goals. if you've chosen math, well it better teach kids math. and finally, I can't say this enough. it is not about the language or the tool. what language do we use in bootstrap? I never actually use the name of it. it's because I don't care. Right? we chose it for good reasons. we have reasons why we chose it. but we are not out to teach kids Python or Java or Racket or anything else. we're here to teach concepts that are grounded in algebra. so don't just overfocus on the tool. so that is it. you guys have been great. I want to leave a bunch of time for questions, so thank you very much. Caitlin. thank you so much. it's, it's really interesting seeing actually some of the similarities between the situation in the states and the situation for us. because even though we have a national curriculum, it's mm -hmm. up to each school to pick and choose what they do and how they do it. Mm -hmm. 